Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion, Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 218. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, happy to be joined by Amanda Bruce. Amanda, how's it going? Great. Yeah, super happy to be on the podcast. I'm always happy to talk about jiu-jitsu and anything jiu-jitsu related. So yeah, super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's funny. I find that the more I train, the more I want to... I think this is just something that happens as you get older in jiu-jitsu, but you want to talk about jiu-jitsu a lot more than actually doing it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I've definitely felt the same thing. I'm like, oh, I could talk for hours, but man, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, while we got you here, first of all, congrats and welcome aboard to our review team. Happy to have you. And thanks so much for helping us out with those technique reviews. Yeah, super excited to be doing that. That actually really aligns with, you know, of course, I'm a jujitsu nerd. So if I can sit there and analyze footage for people, it really is something that I was interested in doing anyway. So super happy to be a part of the team. Yeah, happy to have you. But hey, for those who aren't familiar with you, why don't you give yourself just a quick introduction for the group here? Yeah. Okay. So my name's Amanda. I train out of Autos Jiu-Jitsu headquarters in San Diego, California. I train under Andre Galvao. And I recently, uh, like two weeks ago, I think actually got my black belt. I've been training for about six and a half years. And I, I started when I was about 16 training in New York at a small school. And yeah, ever since I started, it was something I knew I wanted to do as, uh, as much as I possibly could. And I've been able to make Jiu-Jitsu a really big part of my life. So yeah, I'm, I'm based out here in California and my goals are, you know, to teach all over and just get as involved in the community as possible. So I'm really happy to be talking with you today. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming by. And we had talked earlier about potential things we could discuss, lots of things to talk about. And the thing you'd suggested, which I think is just an awesome topic, is overcoming competition anxiety. I get so many questions about this and I'm, you know, I'm an older guy, I'm a hobbyist, so I'm not the best resource to talk about this stuff. But thankfully, we got people like you who really are. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, man, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. Tell me about it. You know, talk to me about your experiences with competition anxiety and let's get the ball rolling here. Yeah. So I have a lot of experience with competition anxiety. I would say I, I started jujitsu as you know, I never thought I would compete. It wasn't even like on my radar. But when I first started trying to compete, it was just like torture. Like it was literally so painful to have to sign up for a competition and like feel all those feelings like a month out, two weeks out. I would get like, I would try to fake that I was sick and tell my coach I'm going to go. I, I would try to get out of it any way I could. So obviously, as I started progressing and, you know, I was doing well, even though I was really nervous. I kind of had to be like, okay, how am I going to get over this? How am I going to become a better competitor? How am I not going to freak out every time beforehand? So over the past, I would say five years, I have done a lot of work on that. And I've been able to do like some, a lot of the bigger competitions and I just feel so much better now. So I definitely have some tips as far as competition anxiety goes. I don't know if you want me to just like dive into some of the things that I've kind of figured out over the years. Well, one thing I'd want to ask you first and foremost up front is, yeah. is, is it ever possible to actually truly overcome competition anxiety? And the reason I ask is because, you know, we've got a lot of hobbyists and casual grapplers in our community, and mm -hmm. I know that they often look at the pros and you see people's Instagram highlights and, you know, these people look like gods and goddesses, right? They look like they're just, they look unstoppable. Everyone does when you look at someone's Instagram highlights, right? It's right. a very curated view into life. But, you know, you look at these clips and you think, man, these people don't look like they're suffering from anxiety. Is this a problem that only mere mortals have to deal with? And <laughs> as someone who competes actively, I would love to know, you know, is it something that ever goes away? Something that you can ever truly conquer? Or is it just an, like a consideration that's always going to be there that you always have to deal with? Yeah. So, I mean, personally, I would say no, like, I don't think it will ever go away. 
but I also don't think that you would ever want it to fully go away. I think that the main difference is going to be, one, you're going to be more used to the feeling of it. So it's not like this thing that's going to become such a barrier to the competition. It'll be more just like a part of the routine of competing. And as well as like, I think you just become better at changing the focus of having it be a feeling of anxiety and kind of transmitting that into, hey, this is actually a feeling of being very excited and learning how to kind of change that emotion of nervousness and view it in a different light. I think that's what the pros are doing. I don't really think like, I mean, I train with a lot of really high level people. If you really sit down and have a conversation with like any of the top level athletes, it's not like they're not going through the same thing. They're just pros at dealing with it. But those feelings that come up, like those are things that I think will always come up because that's the nature of competing, right? Like if you didn't feel anxious, like that just means you don't care. And we all care about the outcome of what's going to happen. So I don't think it's something that you'll ever fully get rid of, but I don't think that the goal is to get rid of it. Yeah, that's a fantastic insight. Without that anxiety, there really isn't a point, I guess, to competition because the whole point of competition is to go out of your comfort zone. So if you're not feeling anxious about it, if competition were not anxiety inducing, I guess the question is, what would the point be? Right, right. Yeah. Like, are you really that detached from the outcome or do you just like, if I really want to win something, I'm going to be nervous about it. And that's okay. That just means that I have that drive and passion that I actually want it to happen. So I think without that, you just wouldn't be as passionate. And as well, like, I don't think you can grow without, you know, the biggest marker for growth is finding something that scares you, but enough that you can do it, but not so much that you can't do it. You know, there's that middle ground of doing things that scare you that really helps you build yourself in whatever realm you're talking about. So I think competition is no exception to that. And like, because it scares you, it, it's something that's going to help you grow. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up because this is something that I had always just called incremental learning and incremental mm -hmm. development. And the idea being that there's a sweet spot. You don't want to push yourself too hard to the point where you get overwhelmed, but you don't want to take things so easy that you're not challenged. And I, I learned recently that in the field of education, they call this the zone of proximal development. Of course, it's got to be a, a big fancy word, but the idea being, you know, too much pressure, too much stress and you can break someone, not enough stress, and you're not challenging them. So there's that magic sweet spot that you got to hit, like you said, where you're you're constantly just trying to go one step beyond your limitations, but not so far that you just completely collapse and burn out. Oh, absolutely. And that's the beauty of the sport, though, is like, you know, my limitations when I was a white belt was like doing a naga, right? So I have to like, <laughs> even some little tournament, that was it. But as you slowly increase your threshold, you're able to overcome bigger and bigger obstacles. And, and that's where the growth really happens. And that's something that I've learned from, you know, training partners and training at a place where the competition mindset is just so, you know, tuned in. And, and Galvao is, of course, an amazing coach. And he's always always talked about finding that limit and just pushing it a little further each time. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, with that said, that's a great pivot into your suggestions here. I mean, you mentioned that you've got some great ideas on how grapplers can overcome and deal with anxiety on the mats. You also talked to course about, you know, man, you train with an incredible room of people who yeah. also have incredible advice on this. I mean, if you want to talk about people who have a, a successful track record of building champions and being great coaches, I don't know if there's anyone in the sport more accomplished at that than Andre Galvao. So I would love to pick your brain here. I mean, you got the floor. Tell me about it. How do we do this? How do we reduce and manage our anxiety? Yeah, well, it's speaking of Galvao, so the, I think the main thing with him is he has this idea of, of course, just making your training environment conducive to making your competitions easy. Like, of course, there's just that saying of like, you know, train hard, fight easy. But that internalization of that idea has to be present in your training environment for you to really use it. So we make our trainings as much harder than competition. Like, I remember being more scared to go into comp class at Autos than I was to go to my competition you know what I mean you know so I think that getting used to feeling those feelings of hard training and and really difficult situations just physically during training is something that helps but as far as a couple other points you know I would say that visualization is probably the one of the biggest tools I've used as far as competing when I was first competing I think I just kind of ignored the whole competition thing until I got there which just never worked out, right? Like I would just ignore it and be like, oh, I'll be fine. And then I would get there and I would have a huge adrenaline dump. So I kind of figured out that that doesn't really work. And so I kind of 
got down this hole of like figuring out how to visualize and basically just practicing those feelings of adrenaline because I feel like personally that's one of the main things that people get nervous about when they go to compete is like everyone who comes to me they're like oh well I'm worried I'm gonna have an adrenaline dump right I don't know if that happened to you but it totally happened to me when I was starting out competing and it's very much a self-fulfilling prophecy too because the more you get in your head about these things the harder it becomes Absolutely. Yeah. I I think that we're able to work ourselves into these states, but knowing that we're also able to work ourselves completely out of these states. So one of the things that I started to do when I was younger is I would just sit down at a random point in my day and I would just visualize the entire tournament day from like the morning I woke up, the routine that I was going to do, like the first match, stepping on the match. I would feel that exact same physiological anxiety that I was going to feel And then I would just tell myself, okay, that's enough. Let's move on with our day. And then I started doing that every single day over and over and over and over. And I got used so used to the physiological feeling of that like really deep anxiety that when I got to the tournament, I was like, dude, I've been feeling this every single day for the past two months. Like this is fine. So you know what's interesting is a a while back we had uh, Travis Stevens on the podcast and we asked him about how he prepares for competition. And one of the things he talked about was visualization. And we got into, okay, well, how do you do that? What does visualization look like? Prior to that conversation, I had always thought that visualization meant, you know, imagine yourself at the top of the podium, Mm. blah, 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 blah. But what Travis said aligns exactly with what you're saying, which is, He tried to visualize not the result, not the win itself, but he tried to imagine the stimulus that you would experience in an actual competition scenario. You know, don't try to feel what it would be like to be a winner. Yeah. Try to feel what's it going to be like when the match hasn't started and you're nervous as hell. What's it going to be like if something goes wrong? What about when you're hurt or you're tired or you're injured or you're getting smashed on the bottom and you feel like you're going to lose? He said that his visualization practice is about that stuff, uh, getting comfortable with the gross, ugly stuff that people don't want to deal with rather than creating this fantasy about what victory would look like. Oh, absolutely. That's actually 100% what I think. I personally don't really, of course, like I'll write down, you know, I have a journal and I'll write down my goals and, and how I'm accomplishing them and things like that. But I'm not visualizing the end result. I have found that when I focus on the outcome too much, it really, really makes it harder for me to go and compete. Like just the same thing as if, you know, you're in a bracket and you're really focused on one particular person in the bracket. It's going to mess up every single match before that because you're not actually focused on the process and the things that you have to do to get to that victory. Just visualizing the victory is easy, but the things that are actually going to happen between now and then are the things that you need to physiologically get used to before they happen. Does that inform your training at all? I mean, of course, this is something that, you know, I, I like I said earlier, I'm a hobbyist. So hobbyist training is very different from competitive training. When I go into the gym, mostly the instructor is showing some techniques and it's up to me to integrate that into my game and practice and drill. When you're training for competition, do you guys train just from a technical standpoint or is there a training element about anxiety and jitters and the mental game as well? Yeah, so I would say that because of how our comp class is set up, it really helps emulate kind of a tournament feel. So like, for example, I remember a few camps, I don't remember which camps, it could have been like ADCC and trials camps, but, you know, we'll do a training where it's like, first of all, the intensity is right there with competition. Like we aren't trying to hurt each other, but we go at it and we push each other a lot in the training room. And I remember like Andre will set up a training where he's like, you need to keep score in this entire round like you need to win every single round today and you need to keep score of what the actual scores are and have that in your mind the entire time and you're not allowed to give up any points like I don't want to see you giving up a sweep I don't want to see this I don't you know what I mean so you're literally kind of visualizing yourself as you're rolling in training as if you were at the competition and I think that's how a lot of the higher level guys and girls who I train with are so comfortable on the mats I mean I can see a lot of the Autos black belts and they just look like they're at cop class. They look like they're so comfortable on the mats because they've trained in such a way that like it's just natural to them to train in that competitive mindset. Yeah, yeah, that that is a great pointer, which is that you're basically trying to 
simulate the stimuli of a competition in the room. Exactly. And, you know, the more that I learn about how elite athletes and other sports train, the more I, I think that in jujitsu, most gyms might be missing this. We had a lot of conversations recently with sports psychologists and sports scientists and they keep talking about this thing they call perception action coupling. And I'm, I mean, I'm a dumbass. I've been trying to wrap my head around this thing and I think I finally figured it out. But basically what they're saying is, you want to make sure that when your athletes are training, you're giving them all of the information and stimuli that they would experience in a real competitive environment. Oh, that and many gyms fail to do that, right? If you go yeah. into class and your idea of training is you're doing five minutes of reps on a non-resisting opponent and then you yes. switch and they do it on you. Like none of these things are relevant to what someone's going to experience in competition. There's so much stimulus in competition that you're just not going to get. There's noise. There's people screaming at you. There's the constant game of things shuffling and screwing up your, you know, your timing and your mindset. Like yeah. what happens if the match is three hours late and then suddenly you get a message saying, hey, you got to show up in the bullpen in 90 seconds. Like yeah. these things don't come up in class when you're just doing regular drills. And so I love how what Andre's got you guys doing is integrating in some of those things you really need to be thinking about in a real competition match. This is stuff that doesn't normally come up in training. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so easy to just go into class and kind of fall into that rhythm of, you know, I go in, I play my A game, I have fun and blah, blah, blah. But when you have to have your mind sharp as you're rolling, you know, thinking about points, thinking about advantages, thinking about whatever rule set you're doing, it really changes like everything you do during the training. You know, I think it's difficult to perfectly emulate, just like you said, like there are things that happen at tournaments that won't happen. Like I know comp class is going to start at this time, but you know, you never know what happens at a tournament as far as that. But what you can do is really just make all of those other facets as similar as possible and, and fix those parts so that at least when you're on the mat, like the actual match feels like something you do every single day. So I think that that kind of training has really helped me prepare more for competitions. Got it. Got it. And is that kind of a formal part of your curriculum and the, the practice that you folks do where you actually have these these mental exercises? I mean, the scorekeeping is one part of the game. I think that's an awesome thing because it trains you to have that variable in your mind while you're out there competing. Anything else that you folks introduce into your training in the room that helps prepare you for those anxious situations on the mats? I mean, something that I'm sure a lot of gyms do, but we do a lot of positionals. I think getting really, really comfortable, as comfortable as possible in extremely bad positions is something that everyone needs to be doing. I think not enough people go in and let themselves be in bad positions long enough. I think you need to spend a lot of time in very bad positions during training. I just think that's how you're going to be comfortable when it happens in a, in a competition because a lot of people have the problem of giving up mid-match, which is something that has almost happened to me. And, you know, you get that voice in your head where you're like, man, I'm bottom out. It's like 9-0. Like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. But if I'm in the training room training every day with like amazing black belts holding me in mount for six minutes, I'm going to keep fighting on once it actually comes to tournament day. So I think that's another thing that's super important to do. Yeah, I love that idea of kind of working from the bottom up and starting with the worst case scenario and then trying to build up a good defense and using that as a kind of a, a toehold to get some confidence and to feel better about things. I know that Danaher talks about this, as does Preet Mikkelsen a lot, where they talk about using defense as a foundation and playing out of bad positions because that's what gives you the confidence to go out there and be aggressive and do well and be on the attack. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that mentality is something that really helped me once I started training with like, I mean, I remember training with Luisa Montero. I have never felt someone have such a strong mount in my whole life. And I just remember after doing an entire camp, like training with her, when I was at a tournament, I was I was in the absolute and I was like getting mounted in some match and I was down up points. I was like, you know what? Like, this is not that bad. Like, I'm training with the best in the world and I've been in this position so many times for so long. And I ended up like winning the match and coming back. So I think you have to train yourself to deal with those types of really bad positions because it's not all highlight reels. You're not always just going to be winning the match the whole time. You might win the match in the last five seconds, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Something I wanted to also ask you about on the topic of anxiety is 
how do you prevent yourself from dwelling? You know, it's one thing in terms of okay. how do you build up a practice so that you're more ready when you go out into competition. But when you're a week out from a major match, it's very easy to get sucked into this trap where you're just obsessing about that over and over again. And that's not going to help anything, but you do that enough and it can break you before you even step onto the mats. So how do you prevent yourself from dwelling on these things and just getting stuck in this negative thought process leading up to a match? Yeah. So I would say like the first thing, which is something that you have to start earlier is, you know, as you're in your camp for your competition or whatever you're doing, you got to just put in the work. You have to put in the work the whole camp. You have to make sure that you're comfortable with the effort that you put in. I think the only times where I've really had a hard time dwelling on the, that anxiety that I feel before a competition is when I know I'm not prepared. You know, Galvao really, really emphasizes this. He always talks about like, if you put in the work during the camp that last week, he's like, the work is done. It's done. This is the easy time. Like, Everything that is going to make a difference in the outcome of this competition has already been done and you've been doing it for however long, you know? So I think being well prepared is something that you can do to just set yourself up to feel more comfortable. But as far as dwelling on feelings, you know, this is something that occurs in our life in so many different ways. It's not just competition, of course. But for me, coming from a background of like, before I got into jiu-jitsu, I, I really got into it because of anxiety, which is funny that we're talking about competition anxiety, but I got into mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu because of anxiety. And I just, something that really helps me is just focusing outward, you know, focusing that energy on something else, focusing outwardly, maybe focusing on helping someone else, just literally trying to transfer that energy to something else that's productive. I really, really try to not even think about the competition that week, like week leading up. Like I'll go into train, I'll do what I have to do. But anytime I start to realize that I'm sitting with that feeling, I have to check myself. I have to be like, okay, this is time that you're wasting right now. That's just not going to change anything. It's not going to help anything. So let's go do something that's just more positive or creative or some kind of other outlet that's not jujitsu. I think it also really helps to have something else besides jujitsu. Like I'm not always just thinking about jujitsu because that can be really, really stressful if the only thing you're thinking about is your training right so like i have school or i have other creative hobbies that i can kind of try to transfer that energy into when i start feeling like i'm i'm dwelling too much on those negative experiences that's a good insight there you kind of need to have a balanced life if jujitsu is the only thing going on in your life and this competition is the only thing that is happening in your life then of course it's natural you're going to fixate on it but having distractions makes things a lot easier if you've got other things that you can direct your attention on it's a lot easier to direct your attention to something else than it is to sit there and tell yourself don't think about this don't think about this absolutely yeah i think that's that's common with with so many different things it's like, yeah, you can sit there and try to fix this thought over and over and over, or you can just direct the energy somewhere else into a more positive way. And that's just so much easier. I mean, when we're talking about people with depression, anxiety, anything, one of the biggest things you can do to get through a difficult period is to really just keep yourself busy and, and focus on other things, right? Because sitting in your mind for so much time can really just make everything worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I want to unpack something you mentioned there. You talked about how you got into jujitsu because of anxiety. What yeah. do you mean by that? So I got into jujitsu when I was around 16. I was just really going through a hard time. I had like an eating disorder when I was younger and I really had a lot of anxiety. I had a lot of social anxiety. I was very depressed. So I was just going through all of these things and I didn't really know what to do to deal with it. Like I didn't know how to get out of the place I was in. And my dad, you know, who knew me very well, I think he kind of knew that I needed something that was going to give me one, a community and two, like a physical outlet for my emotions. And he sent me to a class. And I just remember like it was the first time that I had had a period of like one or two hours where I just felt like I could breathe. And I was like, I felt so present when I was training that I knew that it was going to be something that was basically going to become a therapy for me. And it ended up doing that exact thing. I mean, like if you would have tried to have a podcast with me five years ago, I would have been like, oh my God, no, like never in my entire life. Like I'll never talk to anyone. Yeah. So I really just got into it for that reason. And I just needed something to help center me and help me grow. And it brought me out of my shell. It taught me how to 
overcome adversity. It taught me so much about myself and just I happened to end up really liking it and wanting to compete. So <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Do you find that jujitsu has succeeded there at helping regulate anxiety in the rest of your life? I mean, we hear people always say things like jujitsu saved my life, right? Or yeah. jujitsu helped me overcome some problem that I, I was having. And I've always wondered, is that something specific about jujitsu or is that just the virtue of just having a physical practice? You know, would you would be able to achieve the same results if you got into badminton, for instance, or is there really something about jujitsu that's special in that way? So I've also, I've given this a lot of thought too. So like before I trained jujitsu, I, I started lifting weights and it was like, yeah, it kind of helped and, and the physical outlet was great, but I think there's something about the combination of having a community that's surrounding you and helping lift you up at all times, as well as just like the actual connection and like it's it's almost like a primal thing you're doing, right? Like you're almost you're fighting with people. So it's like this very primal grounding thing to do. I think there's something different about jujitsu and I don't know exactly what it is, but I think it's the combination of like how present you have to be, how much of a puzzle it is, the community, like how amazing it is for your body, minus injuries and all that. So I think there really is something special about the community and about this sport specifically. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I've tried to put my finger on it for a while and I haven't quite come to an answer yet. And I think that maybe it's just a combination of a lot of factors. I guess there's yep. just not one thing about jujitsu that has this magic property, but there's a lot of things that you mix them together and you get a very unique and special formula. I'm the same. Before discovering jujitsu, I just went to the gym and did gym stuff and I had to really force myself to do it. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't find it mentally stimulating. And when I discovered jujitsu, it was just like a total game changer because this was the first physical activity I'd done in my life that I enjoyed doing. I didn't have to drag myself to it and think, oh God, well, you know, I don't want to do this, but I have to, or I'm going to get out of shape. With jujitsu, it was the, not only was it a means, but it was an end in and of itself. And I found that to be the, a big difference between it and other things I'd tried in the past. Yeah. And I also think that there's something very specific that jujitsu teaches you how to get into the flow state. And I don't know another, like, of course, there's probably other sports, but like, for example, lifting weights doesn't really help me get into the flow state. It's a very systematic kind of forced thing that I just do because I should do it. But getting into that flow state in jujitsu, which I think we all know what that feels like, that's something that you can teach your brain to do that you can carry over in many other areas of your life. So learning to get into that flow state can help you when you uh, are doing something artistic or if you're doing something with your work or your other passions. But that specific way of thinking that, that happens when you're just rolling and having fun and, and you're just in the motion of jujitsu is something that I think just transfers to other areas of your life as well. So I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about this a little bit about flow state. I kind of look at flow as being the other side of the coin when we're talking about anxiety. I mean, if we look at anxiety as this negative downward spiral of experience that can make your performance worse, flow is kind of the opposite. It's that upward spiral of almost like a euphoric joy in the performance. Talk to me a little bit about flow and what it means to you and why it's important. Yeah, I think flow is something where, you know, especially coming from someone who, you know, used to be <laughs> and still sometimes is in their head a lot, when you get into the flow state, it's just like everything is finally just released and relaxed and you have the mental capacity to have things just ideas come to you. You feel so like at peace. You feel very connected with your actions. Things don't feel forced. So that's something that I'd never really experienced until jujitsu. Like once I finally had some techniques and I was able to just roll, I remember I would just like, I felt like I was high almost. Like, <laughs> it was crazy to me. Like, I had never had my brain feel so relaxed and natural. And I realized after using jujitsu to find that state, now I've been trying to work on how do I get into that state in other aspects? How do I go towards a creative process and start getting that same feeling to come to me so that I can have ideas coming to me? 
I honestly think that flow state is probably one of those secrets that you need to unlock within yourself to reach your full potential. And I think jujitsu gives you like a, a glimpse on how to access it. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly, for those who don't know, flow is, as a concept, is not one of those magic martial arts woo-woo concepts. It's <laughs> actually a scientifically studied concept. I'm not going to pronounce the author's name because I'm going to mess it up. I know I will. I'll put a link in the show notes to it, but there is a very famous book called Flow that is specifically a about this process of getting into this state of joy in your performance. It's like this intersection of I'm doing something I love. I'm so happy that it's working. I have the skill set to do it. I can express mastery. It is a thing. It is a peak performance state. And if you talk to peak performance coaches, you will often hear them talk about getting to a flow state or a flow zone. And that's just such a big part of peak performance is getting into and staying in that mindset while you're performing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the flow state is something that I didn't really know what it was, but I started, I know the book you're talking about too, and I also can't pronounce his name, <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely remember reading about it. And it's something that you'll find in, in whether it's a business person or an, a high level athlete or someone who's just really good at what they do, they're always going to tell you, and they're always going to talk about flow state because it's that period where your brain is just so open and to new ideas and things just come to you. And I think a lot of times we're stuck in this very like rigid mindset where, we're, where we have these tasks we need to accomplish and we need to, we're kind of just on like this automatic mode, but flow is just feels like a total disconnect from that. And it's really where I think you can tap into your creative, you know, artistic, whatever it is, whether that's in sports or business or whatever. So yeah, I definitely am happy we brought up flow. <laughs> Yeah. So I've got a question for you that's very much tied to that. We did a five-part series on our premium audio service. So like a five-part audio course with Emily Kwok, you know, three-time oh, world champion, a black belt, took 10 years off, I think, to go and have kids and, you know, go into the real world and build up her business. Wow. Came back into her 40s as a mother of three, won master's black belt gold again at Worlds. Wow. She's very much a student of peak performance. So she worked Works closely, I know, with Josh Waitskin, the author of The Art of Learning. She, of mm. course, obviously works closely with Marcelo Garcia, her coach right. as well. And she talked about this idea of building performance triggers. So the idea being, look, we all know we're going to get into this anxious, terrible mental state. We all know that what we want to do is we want to get into that flow state. So what are some hacks that we can come up with so that when we get into that bad mental state, we can immediately switch gears and move into that good state? She brought up some great hacks about how to do this, and I would definitely want to know if you've encountered similar things. So like, is there some sort of conditioning you've given yourself where whenever your mind goes to that dark place and you feel those thoughts of anxiety or depression, is there something you can do to kickstart yourself and kind of reboot yourself into the right direction instead? Yeah, this is super interesting that you brought that up. I was actually talking to a few coworkers at a lab I work in at UCSD, and they're all like psychology majors and stuff. And they, we were talking about flow, and we were asking each other, like, how do you trigger yourself to get into this state? How do you trigger yourself to get into like a meditative state? And they each had a different answer, which I found interesting. One of them was talking about how they use, they have a list of movie scenes. And these are like movie scenes that when they watched the scene, they felt completely just in that state. It just, it elicited a very specific emotion for them. So whenever they're feeling like they need to get into a state of flow or a state of meditative practice, they'll pick one of these scenes and then they'll visualize it or they'll watch it. And so as soon as they watch it, they feel like they're in that same state. So they basically condition themselves to start feeling that feeling based off of that scene. The other person I was talking to used poetry, right? So another creative example, like he would pick a poem that really resonated with him, that that made him feel that same feeling, and then he would use it as a trigger. For me, something that I find gets me easily into flow is very specific songs or music. So I like to have a very specific playlist or, or certain songs that I've used over the years that I've tied to these certain experiences that really have helped me get into this point of flow. So yeah, I use little triggers like that. Whenever I'm starting to feel those kinds of anxious feelings at a tournament, I'll put on that that flow playlist basically and really just sit with that emotion and kind of try to try to ground myself that way. 
Yeah. Music is probably one of the things I hear the most when it yep. comes to a, a performance trigger, something that'll get you in the zone. A lot of athletes I know will condition themselves to have a go time song, like a song yeah. that they tie into their training to the point where whenever they hear that song, it just kind of conditions their body to know, OK, it's go time. And with that, I, I have to ask you, what is that song for you? <laughs> I need to know. Man. <laughs> So it's funny because I've gone through different periods where with songs. So I'm I feel like there's two types of people with music and, and competing. There's people who need to get really, really hyped up. And so they list they have like hype up music. Right. And there's people who need to calm down. So I have like a one hour playlist and then I have my like bullpen playlist and my bullpen playlist is like all like happy Latin music. <laughs> it's like it's something that's very chill, but like something that makes me happy but not something that actually makes me intense, which is interesting. And literally, like, before that, I'm listening to, like, smooth jazz and, like, stuff that's keeping my CNS and my my cortisol levels as low as possible. <laughs> you know, that's a really great thing and maybe a counterintuitive thing, because when people think about their go time music, they're often thinking, well, it's got to be some super aggressive, yeah. loud music that's going to get your adrenaline pumping. But it doesn't have to be. No. And in fact, that can that can be a problem depending on your psychology, because that could push you too far into that overstimulated direction. Right. And then if, you know, say you have like six matches or you're doing your weight class and then the open class, I don't want to ride that roller coaster of like doing something that's going to exacerbate my adrenaline and then letting it die down and then doing it again. And it's much more sustainable for me to do something and listen to something that just makes me feel happy and present and chill and then just go into each match like that because I'm going to get hyped up either way. Like as soon as my feet hit the mat, like I'm going to be ready. It's not like I need to get more elevated than I already am. Some people might <laughs> feel differently, but that's how I've always felt. You know, I used to train at a lot of gyms where they would play like the loud, aggressive music when oh, people yeah. were rolling. The gym I, I train at now, you know, when it's rolling time, the music they put on is usually just absolute garbage 90s era yeah. boy band pop. Like, so we roll a lot to Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. I love that. No. It's, it's great. I rolled in the other day and they were rocking some Lady Gaga. And it's oh just, it's God. funny. I love it because it's such a subversion of expectations of what yeah. a jiu-jitsu gym should look like. I also think there's an argument to be made that if you can put on a good competitive performance while Backstreet Boys is playing in the background, like you can do game anything. Over. Yeah, you can yeah. do anything. Honestly, for me, if I hear Stevie Wonder, like it's game over, like I'm in flow immediately. <laughs> For me, just because I've been conditioned to years of training to this bullshit, if yeah. I hear Backstreet's back, I'm like, I'm fucking ready to go. Oh that, my God, to me, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that though. That's like the best like theme song of all time. Well, it also takes your mind back to a, you know, kind of a, a happier, simpler time, at least if you're my age, you know, but yeah. the nineties was a, a much, a much simpler, less complex, less, Dang, I missed out. yeah, less stressful time than now. And I find it just kind of puts me in a good place, even though I, I don't like that music. I never liked that music. Just, it has kind of a mental anchor for me. It reminds me of a time when things were simpler and more optimistic and, you know, the whole world was open in front of me and I could do anything. Yeah. So there's just, there's good vibes associated with music that in itself I might not otherwise consider to be enjoyable to listen to. No, I definitely think that like the thing with music, it's so much less about for me, it's so much less about what the actual music is. And it's so much more about the attachment that I've created to that music. So like, just like you, like we all have nostalgic music and each thing you listen to comes with a different memory and will elicit a different emotion. So Music's like a tool in that way. So, hey, Backstreet Boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, any anything else that you can suggest in terms of triggers or things that you've used to deal with those those anxious thoughts and those anxious feelings that can emerge around competition time? Yeah, I mean, the other main thing would just be I have a very specific routine that I do every time. And I think having a very specific routine and a plan for me really allows me to kind of just like know that everything's taken care of and kind of just not have to think as much. So because I'm not having to think as much, I can kind of just like rely on the time tested method that I already have. So I would say definitely just having like a specific routine. You know, the other thing, though, is actually on tournament day, I do kind of a little mental trick with myself and I, I put on a persona. I don't know if you do this. <laughs> do you know what I mean? 
I, I do, actually. We've talked about this a little bit here and there. It's something I've been meaning to look into and study more, but this this is a known concept, the idea of basically creating a persona for yourself, almost mm-hmm. like a secret superhero identity. Yeah. It sounds crazy, but there is literature on it. I, I haven't quite studied whether there's been any proven effectiveness into it, but I hear it a lot. We had Roxanne Modafari on the podcast a while ago, and she talked about this quite a bit, too. Yeah, so, like, for me... You know, there's the me that's outside and like I can show whatever emotion. I'm stressed. That's fine. But like on tournament day, I'm going to act outwardly as the person that I want to be on that day. So like there's always I don't remember the quote, whatever it is, but it's like, you know, it's basically like you are who you act like, you know, you act like the person you want to become all of those types of things. So on tournament day, I'm I'm going to act like the type of competitor that I want to be. So I visualize myself and how other people are seeing me and how I want them to perceive me. And that's how I act. So I'm confident. I'm not scared. I feel super excited and happy to be there. I'm smiling. You know, I, I do all these things physically. And whenever you do something physically, it's going to change your physiological response, right? So even if I'm stressed out of my mind, I'm going to show a big smile or something to someone and tell myself how happy I am to be there. And that is going to change my brain chemistry and end up eliciting the emotion that I want anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a a cognitive behavioral therapy technique. They call uh, either acting as if or reflecting as if, if you want to get a bit fancier. But the basic idea is fake it till you make it. And the weird thing is it works, right? Like that's the strange thing. My mom used to tell me that for years. And I, you know, as a young teenager, I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm not listening to you. And then I grew up and I was like, oh, she's been right for 15 years. Like, you know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, if anyone wants to dig into that a little bit further, in the last few episodes, we had a bunch of conversations about things like ecological psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is very much a part of it is understanding that it's not just your brain telling your body what to do, but sometimes your body also tells your brain what to do. And if you force yourself to do things like smile or act a certain way, eventually that does ripple back and change your psychology and you will eventually become the person that you were pretending to be. I know a lot of people don't believe this or they hate it because it sounds like you're being fake or disingenuous, but this is actually a science-backed way to change how your mind works. And I, I definitely suggest people try it. I mean, I've done this to get over fear of work performance or public speaking, and it definitely works, right? If you kind of build that persona and pretend to be the person you want to be, it very much can change you into that person over time. And it's really not as hard as you'd think. Yeah, it's really not. And it, that's, it's something, it's interesting. I So I'm a psychology major and like, these are all things that I'm learning about and I've been able to apply them and, and just practice these techniques. And it's crazy how much it works. It's like, at some point there's going to be this line where you don't even you don't even remember that you were just pretending to be that person like that's just you so all you really have to do is is model the person that you want to become in your mind and act in the way in which they would every single day as much as you can and eventually that's just you and i think that's such a powerful tool but it sounds so simple and like almost sounds like yeah like you're being deceptive but it's really not because you're just trying to become the best version of yourself Yeah, it is a challenge because there's a lot of, you know, semi-mystical sounding concepts out there that really aren't backed by science. But then there's a lot of concepts like flow and CBT, which sound kind of woo-woo and crazy, but they actually do have some evidence that they work. And it, it can be hard for, I think, athletes who aren't trained in this stuff to know which ones are the good ideas and which are the bad. But coming from your background, you definitely are going to be pretty well equipped to understand what tools of the trade out there can work for performance athletes like yourself. Yeah. And I totally know what you mean. Like, I come from a family and they're sci- my both my parents are scientists, right? So like anything that I'm trying to look into, I'm like, okay, where's the data on how it's actually working? <laughs> like, what does this actually mean? What's the physiological basis? Because there are some people get turned off by like, I don't know, law of attraction or like these more woo woo sounding things. But if you break down the neuropsychology of a lot of positive emotion therapy and mindfulness and all of these different techniques, like you will see that there is real science backing up a lot of these things. 
Yeah, it's funny because a lot of those, I mean, you you brought up law of attraction, a lot of those kind of woo-woo concepts in and of themselves, what they're saying may not be backed by science, but the steps they're giving you, they might actually be backed by other science. It's funny. I guess I should say this because sometimes people don't know this for sure. Every year on April 1st, we release a fake bullshit episode on this podcast where we just basically lie and make shit up. So last year we had Sonny Brown from the Sonny Brown breakdown on the podcast, and we did an episode about the law of attraction and how it's going to change your life. And it was, it was all fake, but it was hilarious because we got a bunch of people who replied and said, thank you so much for doing this episode, yeah. Steve. It changed my life. <laughs> and, no, and- you know, <laughs> okay, here's my opinion on that, though. I really think that law of attraction and like all the other more scientific things we're talking about, I really believe that a lot of it's saying the same thing. I just think different people are receptive to different ways of explaining it. Because mm-hmm. if you break down law of attraction, like a lot of it's just affirmations and visualization and all these more like, concrete things that we we can kind of see as science but like it's doing the same thing it's just they're like reasoning behind it gets more woo woo <laughs> exactly yeah i mean with law of attraction for those who don't know right it's basically about manifestation and the idea that if your belief is strong enough the universe will rearrange itself to to meet your every need and sometimes they'll work in this this voodoo about quantum mechanics and stuff i mean obviously not science backed but the interesting thing is If you do what they tell you, which is to basically believe in yourself and act as if you probably will actually achieve success, or at least you're more likely to because because of things like cognitive behavioral therapy, right? You're more likely to get yourself into a good mental place and become confident. And if you do that, you're more likely to to take bold decisions and people are more likely to believe in you because you seem confident. And then through CBT, you may actually retrain yourself to think a certain way. So the funny thing is a lot of that stuff will actually work, just not necessarily for the reasons that they advertised it as. But, you know, there's a lot of things like that where the marketing around something might not be so great but if you dig into it there's there is sometimes a kernel of truth in these ideas and if you if you actually dig out exactly what the piece is that works you can focus on that and get some value out of things yeah i definitely agree i mean i think there's there's a balance right like i'm never going to tell someone if this works for you and this has been working for you i'm not going to tell you it's not backed by science this can't work like if it's going to work for you it's going to work for you because you're the one training your brain to do that and you're the one who's actually going to have those changes so i don't really care how it happens i just care that you know it's working for you so i'm i'm happy with whatever way people want to get to that point but the point is that you can retrain your brain however you want it yeah yeah i mean it's one thing of course if you're just misinforming yourself right if you're just right. believing it in bad info but <laughs> and if you're like not doing anything to like actually go towards your goals <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it, but it's another thing if you just have a different way of thinking. I mean, some people are very analytical and they basically need things to be borderline scientifically proven before they'll believe it and interpret and absorb it. Then there's other people who are very much into the more martial philosophy side of things, right? And they're, you know, they believe more in kind of like the tradition and the spirit of martial arts and they can get to the same place as other people, just they have a different way of going about it. And it's, it's like you said, it's all about how you retrain your own psychology and i mean different people have different things that are going to work for them yeah absolutely i think everyone has to find whatever resonates with them and i don't think you have to listen to like too much advice from anyone else telling you which thing to do it's just you need to explore the options you need to figure out what works for you i've read so many different books like i honestly tried to get myself to fully commit to the law of attraction thing and my scientist brain just like wouldn't let me get quite there (laughs) but then I had to go back towards like Joe Dispenza and like you know neuropsychology and things like that but hey I tried it all out yeah hey on this note one thing I wanted to ask you about here we've talked a lot about prevention when it comes to anxiety so how do you build up good habits and big processes so that you can kind of train yourself to avoid anxiety or to be to focus on more productive things but sometimes despite your best intentions shit happens right sometimes you go in there and you know you're knee deep in a terrible performance or maybe you're just you know you're having a panic attack or you're you're experiencing that adrenaline dump despite your best efforts to the contrary it's going to happen anyway eventually and i would love to know when that does happen 
do you have like a panic button or do you have some process or something that you do when look you you are in that terrible situation you're down 10 points you're in bottom mount you're having an adrenaline dump like everything that you tried for preparation has failed what do you do then man that's a hard one yeah but it does happen for sure i th would say the biggest thing that had helped me because i've had those scenarios i've had matches not in a while but i've had matches where i just completely feel like i'm blacking out and i don't even remember like what the match is about or like i feel that adrenaline happen and the only thing that i found i can really do to change it in that moment is at least control my breathing if i'm going to do nothing else at least i'm going to control my breathing and so i think having like a breathwork practice outside of the competition is something that will help you because practicing like how to breathe during an anxiety attack and you know, there's different ways to do it. And, and especially like if you're actually in the middle of a match, it can be kind of variable. But learning how to work with your breath is something that can really start to lower that fight or flight response. Because when you're super hyped up and you have that adrenaline dump, your heartbeat is super fast, your respiratory system is going crazy. So you have to do something to start that physiological shutdown to bring it back towards the middle. So the first thing I would do is just probably some type of breath work and stuff like that. Yeah, breathwork is one of those things that, you know, my thinking has changed on this quite a bit to the point now where if you give me a day one white belt who's never trained jujitsu before, they have no idea what it is, right? If you asked me what I'm going to teach this person on day one, I probably would have said it before that oh, I'm going to show them the guard or how to do a cross collar choke or something like that. But my thinking now is more that the first lessons I would want to give someone probably have nothing to do with technique. I would teach them things like, how do you manage your breath? Yeah. Because if you can control your breathing, you're going to be in a way better state than if you don't, because that's part of how you not just regulate your emotions, but also regulate your energy levels. Same with tensing up. Beginners have yeah. a tendency to be so, so tense all the time. Yes. And I would say now, if you gave me a day one white belt, that's the thing I would teach them first is you know, control your breathing and stay loose. Those two things are priority more than any technique I could tell someone. You know, like I think as yoga is obviously really helpful for this, but something they do a lot in yoga is you don't realize how tense your body is until you tense up every muscle in your body as hard as you can, hold it and then release again. So that's something that I, I tend to do when I'm feeling really, really anxious at a tournament is I'll just like find a spot to either sit or lay down and I'll like tense up every single muscle and flex as hard as I can and then breathe out and release and do that a few times. And it really helps you realize where you're holding that tension in your body. And I think that's something that can make you just have that more body awareness so that you're less likely to tense up in a match. You're more likely to breathe deep and breathe through your nose is another thing that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very easy to get into the habit of breathing through your mouth, but the... Oh, yeah. Yeah. What I keep hearing all the time is you want to breathe in through your nose, hold your breath for a certain period of time, then breathe out through your mouth. And there's even that cadence that people suggest. I can never remember what it is, but you breathe in through your nose, hold your breath for a certain period of time, then breathe out through your mouth and take a certain number of seconds to do that and then repeat. I mean, just generally having slower, controlled, regulated breathing is going to make things so much easier and it's going to help your regulate your anxiety levels too. Yeah, I've noticed like I've I've also been trying to uh, work on the nose breathing thing. I don't know what the book that got popular recently that was talking about how we're supposed to breathe through our nose and not breathe through our mouth. We're not meant to be mouth breathers, but I've really started trying to add that into my training and I've noticed like not only do I actually have more energy, but I I feel calmer almost when I'm breathing through my nose. I feel like it's it's so easy to like suck wind and and feel your emotions more when you're just like mouth breathing the whole time and really having a good control over your breath through your like breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth you feel so much calmer yeah yeah kind of a related thing but if if anyone out there listening wants a little exercise that they can put into practice right now that's related to this something that i would suggest especially if you're a white or a blue belt is when you're rolling with someone especially someone more senior and experienced than you ask them to tell you immediately if you're breathing too hard or if you're too tense, because it can be very hard at lower belt levels to know that this is happening to you. And one of the easiest ways to train yourself out of it is to have an awareness trigger and just tell your partner, hey, look, if I'm breathing too hard, t stop and tell me right away. If I'm too tense, stop and tell me right away. You do that for a few rolls and you're going to develop an awareness of that. And then it's a lot easier to learn to stay loose, to control your breathing and to be mindful of those things when you're training. 
Yeah, that I remember like the light bulb moment for me. I was training and I white belts, of course, the, every time they grab a gi grip, it's like they're holding on for dear life, right? Like they're trying to, <laughs> they, their whole life depends on holding that lapel, like, and they would just burn their hands out. So every time I would go to a competition and I would see white belts competing after one match, their forearms are done. And I remember one day I was like rolling with someone at my old school and he's like, hey, you don't have to grab the lapel 100%. You can have a grip, keep it kind of loose. And whenever they go to move, you tense up then. But your whole body doesn't always need to be tense. And I was like, what? I was like, I don't constantly have to be using every muscle. And that was when I was like, I need to watch how black belts roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, you see black belts and high level athletes roll and you think that these people just have cardio for days. And yeah. of course, they they probably do. But a big part of how you can keep, you know, regulate your gas tank is just by not being tense all the time. It yeah. makes such a difference. I mean, if you're burning out and you're you're barely able to put in a, you know, a five minute round, a big part of that is probably that you're just too tense and you're expending too much energy all the time. And if you learn to relax and loosen up, you're probably going to two or three X your cardio right away just by doing that. Yeah. And then there's even more carryover beyond cardio is you're easier to to sweep and to do certain things to when you're really stiff, right? Like you're not having that dynamic movement that's really required to be rolling like how you watch the black belts roll, how they just flow between positions. If you're like a stiff board, it's going to make a, a lot easier for people to be offensive on you in, in some positions, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Right. If you're giving someone your arm or your leg and you stiffen the muscles and you stiffen the joints, that becomes a very powerful handle and they can just push pull you with it. If you're more loose and relaxed, it's a lot harder for them to, to do that. Right. It's like trying to get leverage on a spaghetti noodle. It's pretty difficult to do. I was going to say exactly. It's really difficult. It's like there's a few training partners I have who are just so flowy and so bendy and they just go with your movement and they don't hold on to things too long. And it just makes it so much harder to really solidify anything because they know how to move with you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, hey, Amanda, great information here. I really appreciate you coming by and sharing all of this. Any closing thoughts or things you wanted to cover before we tie this one up? Things that are, are really important to mention that we haven't talked about yet so far? I don't think there was anything. I think we covered most of the points that I was going to talk about as far as competition anxiety. Of course, the main point would just be to practice competing. Yeah. That's something that you can do to help with that. Besides that, I think we definitely covered all the topics I wanted to touch on. Awesome. Well, hey, if people want to follow you, check out your work, DM you and ask you questions, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, you can message me on Instagram. My Instagram is, it's just my name, Amanda bjj. So you can hit me up on there and yeah. Awesome. And as I always do, I'll put a link to that in the show notes so you don't have to go on a, a Google expedition. Just what? pop open your podcast player. There'll be a link right there if you want to follow Amanda, maybe send a DM. Definitely would recommend it. Like I mentioned earlier, Amanda's on our coaching team for BJJ Mental Models Premium subscribers. I've got a ton of positive feedback about your reviews. People really, really love them. So Awesome. Good to hear you. <laughs> no problem. Definitely recommend contacting Amanda and following her to see what she's up to. And again, if you're interested in working more closely with us and getting some of those reviews done, the place to go is bjjmentalmodels.com. There's a ton of stuff on there. I think a lot of people know the podcast is the primary thing we do, but it's not the only thing. We've also got what I think is one of the most popular newsletters in the sport. It's free. You can sign up there on the website and you can also join our premium service. You do that and you're going to get access to over 50 hours of courses that we've done with some of the best in the sport. I'm um, just wrapping up last year. We launched uh, a new series with Rafael Lovato Jr., a new series with Claudia Duvall. So we're always trying to create some really unique audio style course content there to help people expand on their strategic knowledge of the sport. And one of the other benefits, of course, is we'll do your reviews. Send us your clips and we'll break them down and give feedback. Amanda's one of those people. So really do appreciate everyone helping support us there. Again, if you're interested, bjjmentalmodels.com. Um, and like with everything else, I'll put a link in the show notes to make that easy. But Amanda, thank you so much for coming by. Really do appreciate it. This was an awesome topic and uh, a chat and a conversation about something very near and dear to my heart. So thanks so much for coming by and sharing all of this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had a great time talking about it. <laughs> Most welcome. And thanks to the listeners as well. Really do appreciate your time and attention too. And we'll talk to all of you next week. Take care.